Well, good day, uh, everybody. I find that I've got really quite a lot to say, so I'm going to get right on with that. First, actually, I'm not expecting what I'm going to say first. I'm not going to expecting that to make you or your clients feel any better. But I must say, I find that when I do say what I'm going to say, it makes me feel just marginally better. So I'm going to say it. The performance of Finsbury Growth and Income Trust over the last 18 months has not met my expectations. And I apologize for the disappointment that that has visited on shareholders and their representatives. I can only say that I sincerely hope that performance is going to pick up soon, um, preferably that it picked up starting yesterday. I, I, I don't know, just soon. Now, if our performance is going to improve, it absolutely won't be because we changed the investment approach, nor indeed change any of the substantive holdings within the portfolio. And I, I hope just for my own clarity of sort of thought and diction, I, I hope you'll bear with me while I just remind you and me of the four investment tenets that we've worked with, with Finsbury over the last, I don't know, 22 years and counting. I'm gonna do this in a quick fire way, four tenets. Number one, portfolio concentration. Second, an unusually strategic and low portfolio turnover approach. Third, we focus our research and the portfolio on a limited number, three or four, on a limited number of industry or thematic investment ideas. Now, those three or four industry ideas have objectively, historically, generated wonderful returns for patient investors. And we are very much of the view that these three or four thematic ideas will generate wonderful returns into the future as well. Fourth and finally, we make a sincere attempt to only, only invest in what we analyze to be outstanding businesses. Now, sometimes, thankfully, rarely, but sometimes we make a mistake about that. And when we do, it always makes me very sad. But anyway. Um, so, so here's a checklist of those four investment tenants. First of all, you can see on this slide that the portfolio is indeed concentrated. 22 holdings, the top 10 stocks account for around and about 80% of the total. It continues to be a low turnover strategy turnover only averaging around 4% per annum over each of the 20 plus years of our responsibility. Now, as to those thematic or industry ideas, on the next slide, you can see that I've laid those out for you with some of the key representative holdings. And what I'd say here is that notwithstanding, notwithstanding on what's happening to NASDAQ right now, 
we simply find it impossible to believe that it's going to be possible to generate the returns that we aspire to and that we know our shareholders aspire to, that it's going to be possible to do that without investing significantly into digital winners, or at the very least, digital transformation stories. In addition, we're still sure that investing in luxury, premium or aspirational consumer brands is also a credible way to generate long-term returns from here on uh, for our investors. And that's why those two buckets, digital winners and luxury, make up the majority of Finsbury's portfolio. We're still sure that certain beloved mass consumer brands are going to generate more value for their owners over time. And we also remain hmm, delighted and tantalized by the final bucket here that we have, this investment we have in our industry, maybe more strictly speaking, the investment that we have in your industry, actually. The provision of private wealth investment services to the British public. And just on that point, um, uh, it's our view that the recent transaction involving our good friends at Bruin Dolphin, that that transaction is a significant event for signaling and perhaps releasing more value in that, um, in that subset. So that's three of the investment tenets. Let's move to the fourth, this focus on what we believe to be outstanding businesses. And I suppose that there are two ways that I can seek to persuade you that we're doing what we say that we do. I can show you some quantitative numbers, statistics on this, and actually I'm going to do that next. But what I, what I can also do is I can talk subjectively, qualitatively, perhaps even passionately about the caliber of holdings within Finsbury's portfolio. What you're looking at here is the five biggest positions we have in the portfolio as of last week. Combined, uh, these investments amount to over 50% of portfolio value. So that is indeed concentrated, but it's concentrated on just amazing companies. There, I've, I've, I've said it. Now, um, Frostro, um, being spoiled sports, have limited me to only 20 minutes for this um, peroration. Um, actually, it would probably take me a couple of hours to explore all the attractions, the investment attractions of this quintet of businesses. So I've limited myself necessarily to just one fact or statistic about each one of these exceptional companies. So uh, let's start with what was the biggest holding last week, uh, which is Relex. Relex is an irreplaceable digital gatekeeper for a number of substantive global industries. As you can see from this statistic, for example, 85% of all US auto insurance policies have to be processed through or approved by LexisNexis 
risk solutions. Insurance executives need relics, as does the global scientific community, as does the global legal community. That provision of data and analytics to those industries has made relics and will allow relics to continue to be a fantastic business. Now, um, just talking about the value of, of data, um, would it surprise you when I tell you, and actually this was a surprise to me, would it surprise you to learn that over the last 10 years, the total share price return on the London Stock Exchange has been superior to the total share price return in sterling of Alphabet, in other words, Google. Um, that did surprise me when I checked on that data because Google has been a fantastic performer, as you probably know, over the last decade, but the LSE has done even better, if only just a bit, but it has done better. And that's testament to the value of the LSE's liquidity pools, liquidity destinations, but it's also testament to the increasing value of the proprietary data that the LSE generates and that its customers need as badly as Relex's customers need its data. Now that 0 0.1 growth rate I've shown you next to the LSE there, that's a year on year growth rate. Of course, 0.1% over 12 months, it's barely growth at all. Nonetheless, it is a significant number because that is effectively the growth over the last 12 months of the old Reuters terminal business. And as David Schwimmer, the chief executive of the LSE, reminded everybody at its Q1 result, it is many, many years indeed since that old Reuters terminal business grew at all. So in other words, this is an early signifier that the combination of the LSE and Refinitiv does have meaningful strategic merit. If there are further confirmations of that strategic merit to come, well, the LSE share price, in our opinion, remains very interesting. Diageo, I sincerely hope that everybody listening to this presentation has a core holding in Diageo. Whether you're thinking about this from a UK stock market perspective or even a global perspective, Diageo is, I think without any debate, the world's best alcoholic beverage company. And it's hard to think of many businesses anywhere in the world with more certain inflation protection than Diageo, given the caliber of its brands, the premium nature of its brands. Now, in addition to that inflation protection, just like the sister investments to Diageo that we have in Finsbury's portfolio, in Fevertree, the number one premium mixer company, of course, in the world, and also the investment we have in Remy Cointreau, the premium cognac company, arguably, in the world. Just like those two, Diageo is also offering access to a secular growth opportunity. All around the world, people are drinking less alcohol, but better quality alcohol, particularly premium spirits. And there is a long road left for that trend to walk down. This is a statistic shared with us by Diageo senior management at our last meeting. As they point out, in their biggest profit pool, which is the United States, even there, the average spirits buying household is only spending a dollar a day. Much, much more to go for in Diageo's view. 
Mondelez is a kind of a quiet winner for Finsbury. We inherited it from Cadbury. It's been listed since 2012. Since 2012, Mondelez's shares have significantly more than doubled. They hit a new all-time high earlier in 2022, so they're still making steady progress. The most recent dividend increase was 11%. The company's just announced another acquisition, $1.3 billion for a Mexican confectionery company. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I think we would argue that the sort of steady predictability of Mondelez's growth suddenly looks both more certain and maybe even looks more attractive than some of the more volatile growth concepts that investors have been so transfixed by over the last couple of years. Sometimes steady but sure is an investment merit too. Unilever, can I really claim to you that Unilever is an outstanding business? I understand that that is a contentious proposition today. What I would say though, is that the share price, the historic share price says yes. Over the last 30 years, back to 1992, there are very few FTSE 100 constituents that have done as well as Unilever. The stock is up sevenfold in capital terms since 1992. And just putting that into context, the FT all share index has just a bit more than trebled. So, you know, really meaningful outperformance from this company over a long period of time. Of course, what we all care about is the next 30 years. And for the next 30 years to be as rewarding as the last, we need to see a continuation of the statistic that I'm showing you here. This, and I understand why they did it, this is something that Unilever management were keen to point out with their recent quarter one results. The fact is Unilever's portfolio of brands has changed quite a lot since 2017. There have been some disposals, but there have also been a meaningful number of acquisitions. And contrary to received wisdom, as management are pointing out here, those new acquisitions are actually performing really rather well at the moment. But we need more of that, please. So there's some qualitative commentary about some of the big holdings, the sort of ideas that we are running with. Let me just turn now to some quantitative support for the proposition of investing in outstanding companies. As you can see on this slide, the average weighted portfolio return on capital, so the average return on capital for Finsbury's portfolio last week was just over 15%. Now, in addition, with the judicious use of borrowing by some of these great businesses that we own with very, very cash generative businesses, some of these companies have been able to enhance their returns on capital using leverage to the point to which that the average weighted return on equity for the Finsbury's portfolio is nearly double its return on capital. It's closer to 30%. Now, in the short term, there is low correlation between companies earning returns on capital and returns on equity as strong as those. There's nonetheless a low correlation between that and their short-term share price performance. I know that rather painfully. 
because the highest return on capital investment we have in the portfolio is Hargreaves Lansdowne and with a 50% return on capital. But notwithstanding that, over the last couple of years, I'm sorry to say Hargreaves has been a diabolical share price performer. Nonetheless, we have to believe because history confirms it. If our companies, Hargreaves and the others, can maintain their current rates of return on capital and return on equity over long periods of time, you should expect returns from our portfolio to converge on those long-term underlying rates of profitability of the companies. At least I really sincerely, sincerely hope so. Now, my next slide is a nightmare for UK equity investors. I just wanted to remind myself and you um, just how a number of indices have performed, just purely in capital terms, how they've performed since the peak of the last tech bull market. So going back to, I think it was December the 31st, 1999, you can see that the US stock market, the S&P 500, it's done just fine over the following 22 years. The world index has been okay as well. But the UK stock market, you know, I, I'm sorry to acknowledge the UK stock market is only a measly 30% in capital terms over more than two decades. Now, after such a prolonged period of disappointment, and I'm a UK equity guy, you, you might expect me to be saying or trying to persuade you that the UK stock market is as cheap as chips and is guaranteed to be the best performing market in the world for the foreseeable future. I mean, I'd love to believe that, I really would, but it, I don't know, and it would be imprudent of me even to, to imply it. I, I'm gonna risk saying one thing though about this. It does seem plausible to me, to us, that after such a long, long period of disaffection, um, we've seen global asset allocators pulling out of the UK. We've seen private clients throwing in the towel on the UK. It does seem plausible that there could be mispricings in the UK stock market. And I just wanted to share with you a number of what we perceive to be mispricings, incorrect pricings of some fine businesses that we own in Finsbury that I've not necessarily discussed yet, but looking at their valuation compared to comparable global businesses. So for instance, I scratch my head and wonder why Burberry is valued at less than half the price earnings ratio of Montclair. These are two medium sized luxury franchises, both focusing on their, their, their outerwear, their outerwear brands. It just seems wrong. Um, Schroders, why should Schroders be valued on this measure at half the valuation investors currently accord T. Rowe Price in the United States? Schroders over the last five years, its assets under management have been growing at 10% per annum. This is a business making steady progress. Why is it so much cheaper? Same might be said for Sage. This is a business making steady progress, but even so, its shares are still, well, on one measure, only a quarter of one of its global peers. Um, to us, as I say, those seem wrong. So look, I, I need to wrap up actually. Um, here's my last slide. Um, 
And this is what I want to say about it. This is not a sales pitch. It mustn't be a sales pitch. But, but I, am, I am still proud of the long-term track record we have with Finsbury. Um, as you can see, not only has it outperformed the FT All Share Index, it, it, it also has outperformed the S&P 500 over that 20 plus year period, doing exactly what we're still doing, investing in high quality UK companies predominantly. And listen, I have no idea at all whether we can do that again. Obviously, I hope we might be able to, I have no idea. But what I do feel strongly is that somebody, somebody is going to make a lot of money over the next few years investing in beaten up UK listed companies. And I just hope we have our fair share of those in Finsbury's portfolio today. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention.